I was realizing that I had been missing all of this critical information and the prospect of like, oh my gosh, I can I can utilize this added detail and data. I had to get my hands on Bookmap like the moment I saw that. The competition was a no-brainer for me. It was a an accountability proposition that I couldn't pass up. Not only are you guys offering a reward for doing what I think any aspiring trader should be doing anyway. So for me, it was like, yes, of course, I'm going to enter this competition. Knowing that I need to be accountable to something means that I am only going to, I'm, I'm going to try that much harder and be that much more process oriented and dedicated to following my strategy. I think that the biggest lesson was taking that time going through in detail and really analyzing, uh, I was finding new things that I had I had completely missed. And of course, the, the community is great. I love looking at other, other people's setups and looking at how they trade and their style. For a newer trader, of course, a great place to pick up process and to connect with people and ask them questions. It's a nice space and I, I like the atmosphere. This It's kind of positive and supportive. The book map based thesis formulation and like entry execution strategy and that has really flourished for me during the time that I was doing Blue Jacket and really made a big improvement in uh, my trading. Okay, cool. So Froth, is that how it's pronounced, uh, your, your username? Yes, Froth okay. and Dylan. Yeah. Froth, Dylan, okay. Well, thank you very much for taking time out of your day. I know it's early for you, but you are an early bird, I assume, and uh, it's absolutely uh, yeah. So you're you are the latest winner of Blue Jacket in July, at the, at the time of recording, at least. And um, yeah, it's always uh, exciting to to you know put a voice as well to the. Uh, I mean, obviously you've recorded lots of videos for the competition, but uh, you know to be able to talk to you is, is something else entirely. So thank you again. It's an honor. <laughs> absolute honor um i'm thrilled to have won blue jacket a little humbled or flattered and um uh, it's great to be a part of the bookmap community and i appreciate uh, you guys for supporting the community in this way so thank you yeah for sure it's good to have you with us so um i like to start these off with a little introduction to you and and i i open it up to you just to introduce yourself and Tell us a little bit about who you are, whatever you're comfortable sharing, you know, however far back you want to go or however brief you want to keep it, but just about you and mm -hmm. who you are. And, and then we'll get into like how you got into trading and, and your trading journey. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Dylan. I'm known as Froth on uh, the Discord community. And I, by trade, I'm kind of a designer, a motion designer, and I work in um for i've done ad agency work marketing work and now in game development um, so i'm a very visual uh, person which we will circle back on later because it has a direct relationship with um, how i work with bookmap um, so i am and you know, i've been trading not too long you know in in terms of um, how i think a, a lot of people i'm fairly newer to the scene. I started trading at around 2021. And before then, I was uh, mostly doing long term investing for retirement, I didn't really have any major exposure uh, to the markets uh, before that time. And I hadn't really paid much attention until GameStop and that whole situation started making headlines. And it uh, does seem like there was a bit of a, a mainstream movement um, and interest that really heightened during that period. And so that was this, the thing that, uh, the catalyst, if you will, that uh, got my interest and um, I started diving in at that point. I see, and, and what was it about the GameStop story that piqued your interest? It was the... Um, I think I had a stigma about around trading that it was purely gambling, um, that almost everyone loses money, 
that there's no real way to put a process and a strategy behind it uh, in order to create uh, consistency and reliable profits in the market. And so that, it was just a black box to me and it was something that uh, I think the stigma around it um, made it that I, you know, so that I was never super interested in pursuing anything further than that. But then this, uh, when all of this buzz started getting generated about GameStop, um, and of course there was noise on social media about people um, making lots of money, like it's it's uh, that kind of gold gold miners prospect, if you will, um, where all these people are flocking to something. So it was not not something that I was ready to jump into, but it was enough of this cultural beat to make me think, well, what, really, what is going on here? And what's, you know, if, if you were to go about this process from um, a kind of controlled perspective, what could you do here? What are the possibilities and the idea, that prospect of just extracting profit from the market uh, this way was, um, you know, it's very alluring, very fascinating to me. Yeah, well, <laughs> the GameStop story is uh, incredible. Uh, it goes very deep and it brings up a lot of questions about markets uh, in general. But uh, you, you mentioned like um, investments for your pension. So were you involved in, in the market in some way or was that purely some passive uh, investments in the bank? Just very passive, you know, like retirement yeah. investment through through my main my main job yeah. and so that was that was kind of it um for me is like oh yeah you you know you put a little bit of money in you dollar cost average um and you build your your account and that was the only exposure i had to how to be um profitable in the markets so the the idea of, of putting a trade on for a few seconds or a few minutes that was completely foreign to me before I had started to dig in, okay. Um, and after I, uh, after my interest was peaked, I immediately dove in heavy. I started learning about technical analysis. You know, what brokerages are there? How much capital do I need to even get started um, doing something like this? And what are the risks? You know, what trading platforms are there? What strategies? And uh, of course, indicators. Because I think uh, something that a lot of newer traders they flock to um, to various indicators, and it's always like a, you've you've seen that famous image of a chart, and it's got like five thousand things all over it. Yeah. Um, and there's it's that like uh, again back to this. Um, there's a magic. There's a secret code to to crack the market, um, and. So I was scouring the web, just trying to understand, like, really, what, what is this all about? Is there something, uh, an algorithm? Is there a code? Is there something that you can do to, to dissect the market? Um, I was watching YouTube. I joined Discord channels. I looked for, like, Discords that had trading alerts. It was, it was all of the, I think, pretty typical exercises that a, a new trader would go through just trying to understand uh, what the heck is going on and kind of getting lost a bit in the noise of the market. I felt foolish, you know, at times knowing that like, okay, this, this is like BS, this thing's BS, that thing doesn't make sense. Um, but at the end of the day, there was always the um, that prospect of being able to, to turn this into something to be uh, a, some various level of like, you know, financial support. Um, and it's kind of coupled with this challenge, this fascinating challenge um, that is always ever changing and ever present. And I'm also a big, I like gaming and I like gaming in like a multiplayer context where things are always mm -hmm. a little bit different. It's kind of the same structure, but there's there's different dynamics at play every day. So I think that was also another big thing that got me hooked is, oh, I could be dedicating my efforts to understanding this 
and in a way you're just um, you're playing another form of a game. Yeah, that's a very interesting way of putting it. Actually, it's uh, <laughs> the biggest game on the planet, probably with some of the biggest rewards, hmm. potential rewards, I should say, and risks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's where the potentiality of it comes in. So, uh, so let's say when you when you you know uploaded your first bit of capital into a brokerage account, what, what was your strategy? How, what did you start with in, in the early days? Um, it was mostly uh, during this kind of era, uh, an interesting era, the GameStop era, there was a lot of interest in uh, small caps, small cap stocks, um, things that were lower priced, highly volatile. And so there were, uh, by nature of just some of these rooms and discords and content that I was exposed to online, that was like the place that I immediately gravitated toward was uh, trying to play some of these smaller cap stocks just using underlying. Um, and that was uh, chaotic and crazy. Uh, and it, it, it seemed very random and out of control. You know, that, that, um, so it wasn't a great first, uh, array into things but i was all over the place too with um also looking at some mid caps and like swing swing trades and things like that uh, but nothing that was really sticking with me nothing that i felt like this was a place that i was comfortable in the market that i could um, really formulate a thesis or a strategy around with any sort of reliability so i, I definitely call it a chaos and I call it kind of jumping from um, one trend or one thing to another just seeking answers and understanding mm -hmm. um, but one thing that was uh, I think just drilled into me from an innate kind of personality perspective is um, risk management so I was paper trading for a lot of my early days I still recommend that people paper trade um, and also uh, when they do start trading with real money, trade in a fashion that allows you to risk a very small amount. Um, so having enough money in a brokerage where you can still um, trade underlying, but small amounts of it, you're only risking like literally like $5 on a trade, $10 on a trade, uh, just to get exposure to the psychological part because the psychology is something i'm going to talk about later which is a ends up being a, a very massive component to um my trading and uh also just the philosophies behind how you can even approach structuring a strategy in the market and, and not going crazy um so I avoided like, you know, doing anything wild and blowing stuff, blowing up my account or anything like that. I just took it very conservative and controlled. And I think that was the right idea, knowing that I had no idea what the heck was going on uh, in the markets when I first started. A very good point as well. I was going to ask if you think there's any difference between paper trading and, and trading small, because obviously there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a totally different psychological aspect when you have money on the line, even if it's a small amount of money. And, um, and I think also as well, the way the trades execute, like if it's a simulated trading, you know, you may never get slipped, for example, but on a real account you, you would. And, um, but there are plenty of options available. You don't have to have a hundred thousand dollars. There are so many, uh, micro and mini futures contracts. So it's, uh, you know, the, the doors are open to anybody to start trading. Uh, in a yeah. smart way. So. Yeah, there's there's an absolute difference between paper and, and real, even small. Um, I think probably a lot of new traders may find that they start, if they start paper trading and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm absolutely crushing this. And then they jump in with money uh, and their emotions start to take, take over <clears> and <throat> that, that fear creeps in, the doubt. Um, 
then then your your brain goes into caveman mode and you mm -hmm. throw away any sort of process you might have had um and that's that's when things get challenging is bridging that gap and and actually risking real capital uh, but starting small um allows somebody to uh, accept that loss and accept that risk and and knowing that placing the trade you're accepting your maximum loss before the trade even goes on and you you know that that is your maximum loss based on how um, the strategy is structured so accepting a five dollar loss you know that if if you can't handle that then you have to continue to condition um, condition your brain uh, to be able to do that and it's like okay what what can your brain tolerate can it tolerate a a one dollar loss somehow i don't know quite quite how you'd be able to manage that level but um that was what i had to do you know i had to start very small and then after i would uh, develop some consistency then i would slowly increase uh, my risk at that point yeah yeah it is interesting how a lot of people tend to come to trading with the desire to make a lot of money but then that actually impedes your success in most cases and it mm -hmm. becomes you know if you look at it as a game like you said a multiplayer online <laughs> game it's uh, it actually helps because the, the numbers are just numbers in a, in a sense um and that that can help i don't know if you agree with that but that's uh, a thought i have yeah i agree and um i think of now's a good time to talk about um some of the after i had cut through the noise which was about a year and a half of me floundering around and, and trying a lot of different stuff um and ultimately kind of being frustrated and challenged meanwhile the market was also going through a lot of changes at that time um but about a year and a half in I tried to cut out that noise and I tried to focus specifically on supply and demand and also on the major indexes. So watching the SPY and the Q or, you know, ES and Q um, and applying a supply and demand strategy and uh, also doing a lot of conditioning of my brain with trading psychology and process oriented management. And so really like cutting out the small caps and cutting out like watching 10, 15 different tickers a day and just looking at uh, the ES, the NQ, uh, volatility indexes, uh, which we'll talk about when we do some trade reviews mm -hmm. and um, other kind of macroeconomic factors, like looking at the bigger picture and then just focusing on the major indexes with a specific uh, a supply and demand strategy style that's where i started to feel a lot more comfortable a lot less chaotic um, i could process all of this data much uh, much easier and then start to hone in on my personal trading style and strategy uh, so that that was a big turning point for me and um, i also love to uh, watch like there's a a great series by Mark Douglas. He did trading in the zone and he has some webinar or seminar videos on YouTube. I highly recommend anybody watch his series uh, because he covers his main points in you know a couple of hours of this. Uh, but the idea that um, understanding that the, the market is presenting these unique situations every time, and that it's not about any single trade it's about the composition of hundreds or thousands of trades and the probabilities and the statistics behind that and me uh, i had to grapple with the fact that i couldn't make a, a winner of every trade and that i couldn't um, i have no control in this domain i'm at mm -hmm. the the whim i'm at the mercy of the market um, and understanding and being able to let go of that ego and that control and just be okay with it. Um, that was a big 
another big turning point too. And Mark Douglas, he does a great job of um, describing the psychology behind that and some of the methods and, and processes that you can put into your trading strategy um, in order to make that a reality. And that was that was another big kind of um, turning point for me is is applying that and understanding that from a psychological standpoint and, and being okay with uncertainty, being okay with, with fear, um, and trying to remove those emotions from the process. Yeah, absolutely. Mark Douglas is a, is a must read and must watch for every trader out there. Um, so maybe we can now jump into Bookmap specifically and how you discovered Bookmap. Um, and we can also talk about the psychology aspects perhaps a little bit later or how it ties into trading. But um, I'm curious how you discovered Bookmap and how that impacted your trading, how it changed your trading. I, I discovered it through a supply and demand based trading community and people were posting charts and videos of Bookmap. I had never seen this before. Um, but I had always been seeking more detail in my technical analysis. Um, so seeing the order flow in this manner was profound to me when I first saw it. I thought, well, oh my gosh, I'm what am I missing out on? Because I had been formulating all of my trade setups and everything based on candlesticks and use, still using, you know, volume is a huge part of it and volume is still such an important part. Um, but I had this volume-based supply and demand strategy, but I was using candlesticks and the time frame constraints that candlesticks put on you, where I would have a, a strategy, for example, of like, I'd wait for a five-minute candle to close. Well, like, really, what is what is a candlestick? What is a, a, the uh, importance of a five-minute candle closing at a certain level when the market moves in this dynamic fluid state where no specific time frame or moment um, is necessarily uh, going to dictate like the success or failure or something. So I was realizing that I had been missing all of this critical information and the prospect of like, oh my gosh, I can, I can utilize this added detail and data. Um, I had to get my hands on Bookmap like the moment I saw that. I said, okay, I've got to switch over. I want to know more. I want to understand um, how Bookmap is visualizing this stuff. And as I mentioned at the beginning, like I'm a designer, I'm a very visual person. So the visual language of Bookmap, once I got in there and I started to spend, you know, 10, 20, 100, hundreds of hours in Bookmap, I have learned how to internalize and kind of process the visual information. And it is such a visual application that it's just like perfect for a visual person. Mm -hmm. um, and you start to get into this flow of just like reading the, reading the order flow, the speed of uh, the transactions, and then how it's all painted in front of you with book map and it just becomes this like organic experience. It's, it's pretty cool. So that was my moment of discovery was through, through community. Um, and then I had to, I had to jump in after that and check it out for myself. Great. Yeah. It's uh, definitely beautiful to watch sometimes it's quite mesmerizing. I like the way you're describing it as being organic and fluid. Um, it's definitely quite a unique perspective. This is also the way I look at the market as a side note as something continuous and uh, organic rather than mechanical, even though there are a lot of, you know, very simple mechanical rules, but it's still the, the outcome is quite complex uh, and it becomes fluid and organic, as you say. Um, I'm just curious, uh, this may be, I hope this comes out clearly, but you mentioned before about uh, trying to approach the market. Uh, and, and develop some kind of um, supply and demand way of looking at the market. But also mm -hmm. you mentioned, you know, you're looking at uh, you know, fundamentals or economic events and so on. So 
would you describe your current methodology as more top down or bottom up like are you looking at like the you know the global macro picture and the the the, the big levels and drilling down or are you looking more at the you know what's happening here and now the order flow and then kind of building out the the view from that top down uh usually i'm i'm starting with um economic analysis and some fundamental analysis about uh, especially in in with with for um this rate hiking cycle and this inflationary period um understanding what the status is of the economy that's where i'm beginning so i'm trying to understand what what sort of cycle are we in currently and what news events what major information is there and that's what we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later in some of the charts of using like the volatility index um, talking about when news drops and how the market is going to interpret that news those are the first places i begin and then the supply and demand on a higher time frame comes into play and that's mostly to um, recognize areas where we may have some potential for institutional activity um, and so the the supply and demand a lot of that charting and planning I still do with uh, candle charts and then I will go into the trading day in bookmap having these levels uh, defined and book maps really um, about kind of my, my process is defining these areas of interest. And those areas of interest can come from a supply and demand zone based on a, a candlestick chart. They can also come from just the intraday price action. But it's always the best, I find, when I have something, an area I've defined pre-market. Uh, and then that area is traded into, and then I look to book map uh, to see what the reaction is from uh, from traders and participants in those areas, and then formulate a plan around what I see on book map. But it always, I'm not going to put a trade on until I have a thesis that is confirmed by the the price action I'm seeing on book map. So, so you you put more emphasis on the order flow, or like, would you trade against your fundamental view if the volume or the order flow was uh, showing signs of moving in that direction, or do you wait for confirmation and trade only with the fundamental view? Can definitely change, but th those are some areas where if I'm seeing. Um, economic indicators or other indicators suggesting one direction and then the order flow is suggesting the others oftentimes i will proceed a bit more with caution mm -hmm. if uh, um, before putting a trade on to kind of get a better understanding so that that kind of plays into like aggression level or conviction level um, when actually uh, formulating that thesis and then executing on it certainly when everything is in harmony and you have all of the signals lining up um, those are in my experience going to become the highest probability trades and so i'm much more likely to be more aggressive on mm -hmm. an entry such as that versus one that has conflicting information where i might just sit on my hands Mm -hmm. and wait to see what the market does there and maybe miss an opportunity but that's okay i see so uh yeah in terms of confluence do you do you uh get more aggressive with your position sizing as, as well or do you have dynamic position sizing in terms of uh, you know if you have a lot of confluence you may be willing to risk more or is it purely in terms of how you enter and exit trades it's for me it is position sizing if i'm if i don't have a lot of confidence in an area um i may put an initial like a starting position because i currently in my strategy i'm scaling in and i'm scaling out 
uh, and I look for um, the signs of progress. That's what I like to call it. So a, a signal of progress is is the trade working in my favor? Um, and a lot of times with my strategy, I'll be trying to um, catch like a, a retracement. Let's say that there has been some uh, let's say strength in the direction of my thesis after there's so been some strength proven and then I'm waiting for price to return and provide a better risk to reward uh, if there are more factors aligning for me I may be more uh, like more likely to put on or start to scale into that position as price returns to my area of interest but before I see on the order flow itself that sign of okay we are going to continue to progress in the direction I want um, so if I have high conviction of in in a play I may begin to scale in a little bit sooner than I would if I didn't and I wanted to wait and see a bit more confirmation and then start to scale in it's kind of a nuanced thing to talk about and maybe we can discuss yeah. some of the more of that stuff during the charts yeah I was um, just thinking hopefully that answers it <laughs> Yeah, for sure. It's uh, quite an interesting approach. It's kind of, because you, you, there's so many things here. It's not just the order flow elements, it's the fundamentals, and then you're kind of looking at the momentum. I guess you're looking at the trend, but you're trying to enter on a pullback. So there's a, a lot of different factors. It's not it's not like we can just put your, your straight trading style in one particular, one particular framework. Um, so yeah, we can talk about that more when we look at your charts. Maybe we can now talk a little bit about Blue Jacket, if you don't mind, and why you why you decided to join the competition. Um, mm -hmm. I would be interested to know. Yeah, uh, the competition was a no brainer for me. It was a an a, an accountability proposition that I couldn't um, pass up. Not only are you guys offering a reward for doing what I think any aspiring trader should be doing anyway. Um, so for me, it was like, yes, of course, I'm going to uh, enter this competition. I want to share um, share some of my insights and kind of trade recaps and setups that I'm seeing. Uh, and it's if it's of help to anyone else, like that's wonderful. But for me, it's about being accountable. And I think that's um, a big thing going back to trading psychology. If you're not reviewing and, and being accountable for your decisions you're making in the market, then it, um, it allows you the ability to not hold yourself to specific rules or processes and the market really should be approached from a very process-oriented strategic standpoint because it's not about any single trade. It's about thousands of trades and the statistics and averages over those trades. Um, and uh, so the, the idea of Blue Jacket and having to share and put yourself out there for others to potentially criticize or scrutinize, um, it means that your ego is on display or it's it's at risk right uh and and having that just that small psychological accountability of saying if i'm going to put a review up from this trade and it was like a garbage trade and i was flustered and i didn't really have a valid thesis like what am i going to put out there that i that this was uh, like garbage like it's it was it was there wasn't a valid thesis for this trade or anything so just the nature of like i i need to be accountable so that when i do a recap i can properly explain why i got into this setup and why i took this trade that has a a uh, reverberating effect of the daily cycle and strategy um knowing that I need to be accountable to something means that I am only going to I'm, I'm going to be, try that much harder and be that much more process oriented and dedicated to following my strategy so that um, when there is time comes time to share that it's um, 
that there's a very strong conviction and valid thesis that I can stand behind and, and know that I stand behind this, I'm going to share it with others, and I'm going to be okay with that. And if people are trading and they are in isolation and they're not listening to um, what their review, like if they don't do a review process or they're just ignoring their emotions and their, um, uh, what's the right thing I'm trying to say is like if they, if they don't um, adhere to a process and they aren't holding themselves accountable to what their actions are, then it's much less likely that they'll learn and improve. That's right. And so mm -hmm. this just provides that um, space to be accountable and to uh, kind of, in a way, it like forces you to improve because of it. Yeah, exactly. And this is one of the, the reasons I'm really happy with Blue Jacket. Um, obviously, journaling is incredibly powerful, but when you add in this layer of the community and you bring in an extra layer of accountability and the, the ability to learn from traders who may be better than you and to help traders who may be less experienced than you, uh, it's, uh, it's something completely new, I think. Like, it's not just journaling, but I, I'm, I'm calling it community journaling. It's kind of, you're yeah. adding this element of, uh, you're getting an extra, extra eyes and uh, extra experiences. It's, um, I think it's something quite powerful. Um, mm -hmm. are there any specific lessons from the competition? Maybe something you did during your trading that you, you, you kind of learned from a mistake or a way of, of, of iterating your process and improving, or maybe something somebody said to you during the competition, something you learned from somebody else. Uh, any any lessons that you took from it? Yeah, I would say that for me, the when I started putting some video reviews together, which was kind of new, like I had not, I hadn't really done that prior. I had done mostly kind of the screenshot based setups, um, but going through and doing the video review and really examining. Um, multiple trades from that day, it had me spending extra time analyzing and um, breaking down what I had done. And in my busy life, sometimes I didn't have the time to, or didn't take the time to go that meticulously back through what I had just done uh, during the trading day. And I think that the biggest lesson was taking that time um, going through in detail and really analyzing uh, I was finding new things that I had I had completely missed you know information that was on the chart that I had missed for one reason or another and so I think that the biggest learning lesson for me was just um, spending more time reviewing and analyzing and being hyper scrutinizing why I, I took that setup or um, why did I choose to scale or sell at this point? Was the market sending a specific signal? Was there a signal in the order flow that was kind of a valid place? Um, and so it would, it's um, revealing. You can, you can kind of look at your, reveal your some of your weaknesses uh, through that process. And the more time you spend and the more detail you go into that process, I think the quicker that you'll find um, some of these areas of weakness in your trading and, and be able to address those. Um, and of course, the, the community is great. I love looking at other, other people's setups and looking at how they trade and their style. Um, and so there's been a, a lot of learnings for me of, I think what I find most interesting is when I have looked at a specific moment and I've mentally noted that as like a, a key moment during the day and I see other traders and how they trade around that moment and what they saw and what they did um, and whether or not it differed from my perspective, um, it, it uh, definitely provides a 
great new view into um, what other people are are doing and how they're doing it. And it's it's a for a newer trader, of course, a great place to uh, pick up process and to connect with people and ask them questions and talk about. Um, well, could you go a little bit more into that or or you know? So it's it's a nice space, and I I like the atmosphere. Uh, this it's kind of positive and supportive, um, and there's not a lot of noise or distracting commentary. I like that it's very focused on on the trades and and the setups. Yeah, I, I love that. It's a, an atmosphere. It almost makes it it brings it to life. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really happy to hear this. I've heard this from other w winners of uh, Blue Jacket too that. You know, everybody's coming at this uh, with a very professional attitude. Everybody's serious, but we've managed to kind of help incentivize traders to to start to journal more or go a little bit deeper. You know, because mm -hmm. it's one thing when you explain it to yourself; it's another thing when you explain it to somebody else, and they may see a hole a hole in your logic, or or they may say, you know, there's another way of doing it, and it it broadens your perspectives. Um, and it's another thing that's incredibly powerful. Um, just a kind of a side question. Would you say that your trading has improved more from removing your, your weaknesses? For example, you know, some people say like you have different, you have your A game, your B game and your C game and just removing your C and B game and trying to focus on your A game as much as possible is the thing that brings success or is it more doubling down on your strengths and just getting better at drilling down into your 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 strengths and improving those. It's probably both, but I'm just curious if you think one or the other is uh, has been more helpful for you. I would say it, for me it is removing um, some bad tendencies. For me it's like a, oftentimes if I have missed a great setup then i'll get fomo like a lot of people get some fomo going on and if i historically have like forced some setups later on trying to find a way to still capitalize on the market even if the even if i know well oh, that was the moment that moment right back there that was it that was like the best trade likely to happen today um and so uh, this process has allowed me to reflect on um, some of these negative tendencies and cut them out, kind of be more patient, uh, understand that I really have this much more intimate relationship with the order flow and knowing like a specific area of, of an area of interest on the chart like if, if the if price doesn't trade back into this specific area that i'm not going to take any further action unless there's a um, very strong signal that comes from the market um, in a different spot so kind of being more selective uh, and um, picky and patient i think that's what um what i have really honed in on in terms of refining my strategy is um, getting that uh, sort of intimate um, order flow analysis down and the journaling and the video creation you know that has all amplified uh, my ability to kind of do that but uh, it's it's back to the magic of book map and uh, what you can visualize through bookmap uh, so that that portion like definitely just the the bookmap based uh, thesis formulation and like entry execution strategy um, that has really flourished for me during the time that i was doing blue jacket uh, uh, doing the competition you know for the last couple of months i'd say i've been doing this stuff so um, it's really made a big improvement in uh, my trading. Yeah, and, and you're still active in the room. You've already won and you're still there. I, I'm really appreciative of that. That's great because it encourages others as well. So it's really good to see. Uh, yeah, maybe this course. is a good time to jump into some of your charts if you're ready. Um, yeah, let's do it.
and look at some of the content that won you the competition. Here we are. Okay, Dylan, whenever you're ready, take it away. Let's jump into some of your content. Okay, I'm going to share five different setups uh, from the Blue Jacket competition. These are all shared in the channel. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about these setups and, and it uh, will help reinforce some of the talking points about my strategy. So this is a great one to open on because we have um, a good example of how I use supply and demand. Uh, we have here um, on the prior day close, there is a tremendous amount of volume um, that came in. And then during the open of the next day, uh, we see a volatile upward move, a quick upward move away from this price area. Um, and so these, what I'm typically look for with these supply and demand setups is I'm looking for that volatility, the aggression to move price away from an area. And the concept is if price moves away quickly enough, there's a probability that there are unfilled orders like institutional orders still sitting at that price level and if price returns to that area that there's a higher probability that those unfilled orders will become filled and that you will then get in a further imbalance um, in the direction that you're uh, wanting to head uh, so we can kind of see that that um, illustrated here we get this aggressive move away and then we get a retest into the area where uh, the price moved quickly away from and then we get this bounce up. So that's the setup for this um, What we're going to do is in the next slide look at book map and we're gonna see right down in this 4589 area so here's 4589 um, this was the uh, Interaction at that level when we came back into demand um, And this is why I love love like seeing book map uh, versus a candlestick chart, you wouldn't have any of this information uh, to really uh, look at. So we have price entering the demand area, and um, that again, that concept of price moving quickly away or seeing aggression, those are these types of nuanced signals I look for um, intraday in the moment, uh, and I'm making a trading decision in the moment based on those signals. So we have price move up and away from this area after heavy selling pressure. And we get a retest in that area with aggressive selling, but we can see that the passive orders are continuing to reload at this level, even after price tests into it with aggression. Again, even more aggression coming in uh, here at uh, a little bit later point in time, followed by another sudden move to the upside. And so after seeing the lack of progression to the downside with this level of aggression at my area of interest, which is this demand zone, which is kind of the basis for the thesis, this is kind of my signal of, okay, we are seeing some participation at this area, um, price is being supported, now is my opportunity to put risk on, um, set my stops, and set some price targets and scale in. Um, and so th this is uh, kind of the, the, a great example of um, looking at how price was unable to progress lower, putting risk on, and then uh, waiting for this thesis to play out of, of a bounce to the upside. And then here's the resulting image. So we were just looking at a small uh, portion down here and the resulting bounce was quite a good one. 15 points or so yeah great trade um if i may mm -hmm. just uh, about this trade you mentioned uh, you know <laughs> trading also involves a lot of risk right uh, i saw that you have uh, your stop two points below the truck sellers um i'm curious uh, what about uh, in terms of time do you use time stops as well for instance if prices continued bouncing around that level for the next Let's mm -hmm. say minutes, would you still be in the trade or will you reassess? I would reassess if we saw um, 
this being this, and I, I, I kind of call it an inflection point. I've used that term in some of my videos. So this 4589 level, this is kind of the inflection point of, I am looking for a very specific reaction at this level. If price were to breach below it and we were to continue to see heavy selling pressure, then we're going to get into some trading psychology of if there are participants who have entered a short position and they are in at 4589, then any value below that means they're in profit and they're happy and they're seeing continuation. Um, so if this lingered around and we started to trade beneath this area, I would give it a little bit of wiggle room, but typically if we would breach below that um, inflection point and we come back and we try to test that inflection point and are unable to, pr to progress above that area, that's a red flag for me. Um, I am definitely going to keep a close watch on the price action and if we get failure uh, I have my maximum loss already in place which is based on that stop loss value and it really it for me it depends on if I exit the trade early with a intent to re-enter it if I see progress in the direction I want to go versus um, waiting for that stop loss to be hit. And that's something that is oftentimes is a, dyna a dynamic thing for me. Um, but I'm always, I always have a stop and I always have a max loss. That's what's critical about it. And it's whether I'm comfortable with <laughs> accepting that max loss because I have conviction that this trade will work out versus what I had planned or anticipated, what I wanted to see is not unfolding, then I, w I may take action and reduce that loss by exiting at an earlier point. We'll move on to the second one here. Okay, so this one was an example of how I like to use the VIX futures, it's the volatility index. Um, I guess a simple summation is when there's higher volatility in the market, this VIX index will rise. And it also, uh, when traders hear volatility, they hear wild price swings, they hear things that are um, maybe unexpected, uh, things that are out of the norm. And that oftentimes is a catalyst for fear and a, a, a catalyst for fear or fear is gonna generate um, potential uh, people to take risk off. If people take risk off in the market, they're going to sell out of the position. So if the VIX is going up, there's a probability, a high probability that the markets are going down because of this fear. If the VIX is going down, we're seeing less volatility in the market, there's less fear and uncertainty, then there's a probability that the markets will bounce and they will go up. So that is just a very simple explanation of kind of how I use the VIX. So yeah. I look for these moments where I see the VIX and the ES price action diverge from each other, meaning um, we have a very strong downward move on the ES. We have sell-off, but the VIX in pre-market was up at 1575 or so. And despite all of the selling pressure, the VIX was not breaking the high, whereas if the ES is kind of breaking down at the, these lows, the e, uh, ES breaking down at the lows, the VIX is not breaking up these highs. There's a divergence uh, between these two indicators, these two uh, uh, charts, and that leads to a higher probability of uh, the downside pressure on the ES being um, prolonged. And so there's the potential for a bounce. So that was, um, that was the divergence that I spotted. That is the formulation of the thesis, but it's just a thesis. It's just an area of interest. And that is where the next step comes in, where we dive into book map. Um, so let me just back up here. We've got this um, 45, 65 area. So we're gonna be like zooming in on this little moment right here. 
So here at 45.65, we saw price come down. We're noting that the VIX has, has diverged, that it's not displaying signs of intense or amplified volatility or, or fear. And the market makes this aggressive move back up from the bottom. Again, it's like if you're going for the supply and demand strategy, it's like we're, we, we have created, almost created a mini demand zone with how quickly price did move away. And we also see some passive orders kind of filling up the book here to support price. And this all culminates with some very aggressive, large buying prints coming back up into that area. So that tells me we have some active participants up here. We have buyers that are willing to defend a price at this area. So if we return to that area, there's a higher probability that we will get a bounce. We were just looking at this little, um, little window here and price does return to that area and we see passive buyers um, fill up the book again and a bounce to that area that was good for uh, about 20 points. And then again, we return to that area. So that is defining an area of interest. This was a particular recap where I personally did not catch some of these entries, but it's just um, a confirmation of how I um, go about defining a thesis and then ways to capitalize on it afterward. All right, grabbing the third example here. Same idea, so we don't need to go into as much depth on what's happening here, but it's another divergence. We have the ES making a very exaggerated uh, uh, selling move down to 45.68. You can see that these two points align with each other. So the, again, the VIX is no, no longer, uh, if, if these were equal, and the market was kind of going as anticipated, this VIX uh, signal is very likely to be much higher up at 1575, it's down at 15.6. So we have again, the VIX making a lower high, the ES essentially making a double bottom or, or almost a lower low here. So that's the, the trade thesis again, is we're coming down to an area, um, we have a divergence and then we see something very specific in book map after that area of interest is identified with the thesis that I'm going to look for a reversal bounce to the long side. So we have um, a lot of juicy stuff in here. We've got some very he heavy selling pressure. We've got capitulation volume. I like to call it capitulation volume. That's basically just volume that is um, much stronger than the average potentially even as strong as like opening volume. Um, so we have a heavy amount of orders being transacted in this area, multiple attempts from sellers to kind of bomb, I call them tape bombs, but they kind of bomb price down here and a lack of progress followed by an immediate rip to the upside. This tells me that there that could have been a, a large participant down here who's absorbing all of these aggressive selling orders and that after this large participant has gotten what they wanted, uh, they are pushing this imbalance back to the upside. So after seeing this selling pressure come in, this buy sweep come back up, this becomes that area of interest that was confirmed by the VIX divergence later. And then I look for a retracement back into an area where I feel is provides a good risk to reward but also where I feel like these uh, participants will become active again. So we have uh, a sudden dip back into this region. This was one of those ones where I had the, the conviction to uh, go ahead and, and scale in even off of a very sudden move down like this. Just start to put risk on, um, not looking for uh, a confirmation necessarily in this specific moment, uh, but to begin to scale in because of the factors in the market. Um, and these guys also, what's interesting is there's a lot of these orders, you know, are happening very quickly through this area, but a lot of these orders are kind of settling, they're transacting at this lower level here. And it's just about right where we got this dip into. So if we're thinking about people who are, 
who are in short positions, price moves uh, out of their favor and they get an opportunity. They're saying, oh gosh, I, I don't think this trend is going to, to continue. I'm experiencing psychological pain because my position is in the red. When, when they get that glimmer of hope of, oh my gosh, I could almost get back to a break even, they, that is an opportunity for them to cover their short, meaning they are buying back and they're fueling price even higher. So that's where I also um, like to take a psychological perspective on the market of who is in pain, who's experiencing pain, who's experiencing euphoria, um, and how can we capitalize on someone's pain or euphoria and kind of ride the coattails of the larger participants in that direction. Um, and so here's a result of that. Uh, we were zoomed into this small area here. We saw this dip down and then it was basically a, a, a huge short, short squeeze up to the upside. And this is showing to, um, some of my scales uh, later on after a price action had returned to this higher level. Two more to go, here we go. So this is relatively early in the morning. We had a large aggressive sell-off and it was uh, pretty much unchallenged, this, this sell-off. Um, culminating in, in a, an aggressive seller here. I know we have lots of aggressive sellers, but this, this particular area becomes of interest because we had a move back out of this region later. Uh, we also had passive orders that um, got filled down here and then passive orders reload. So the area of interest for me becomes this 45, 40 area. And this one you know, doesn't necessarily have to do with a divergence or anything. This is more of like, let's just look at the straight order flow here. Um, seeing price move up quickly from this bounce, uh, I was interested in looking between this 45, 42, 45, 38, kind of this range to see what price would do and we came back into it. So let's take a look at, uh, let's see here. Did we have, oh, we did, look at this. Okay, sorry, I should have like reviewed these slides, huh? So we did have a divergence here. This is another VIX thing. Yeah. Uh, VIX putting in a lower high uh, right there. And this isn't necessarily a lower low, it's kind of a double bottom, but we're seeing a little bit of that divergence. So that's just another added confirmation just uh, on that note uh, i thought it'd be a good chance to interrupt you yeah. um this as you mentioned like uh, you use it as a proxy for fear right i guess that's why they call it the fear index mm -hmm. but am i right in understanding that the reason um prices of the futures prices usually go down when the vix is high is because people are using options to what well, first of all the vix is used to price options and people yes. are using options generally as a kind of hedge yeah so they, they're buying uh, puts and if uh prices you know, if or if volatility implied volatility is high then prices probably falling right is that a good way of putting it yeah that's correct mm-hmm Okay, just wanted to uh, clarify because I guess sometimes looking at the why of things can be quite helpful, especially for those who are not maybe familiar with the, the VIX. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we we ended up returning to this area. So what we're looking at is a zoomed in version of this region here. And we had that the passive orders reload on the order book um, and seeing these absorb here some aggressive uh, buying back up above and then even more a little bit of reloading but more importantly potentially some buying buying ice uh, where there's even more orders that are being filled that aren't listed in the order book um, and then seeing the failure to progress and then this aggressive move up out this was that critical moment for me where I was willing to put risk on um, because of the lack of progress with the aggressiveness that was coming in at this level. Um, and here's uh, a result. So we had that abrupt move up and then a lot of these participants that were potentially expecting more downside, they're feeling the pain um, and they start to cover some of their positions, potentially get a short squeeze 
uh, and this moved up and I ended up covering the, the position after seeing this large amount of volume and price squeeze up into um, a previous area. I don't know if I can see it here. Yeah, so if we look back here, um, I do this on the inverse as well. So if we have aggressive selling or price leaves, uh, we see a high volume and then we see price quickly move down away from that area. So if it's a long position and I'm looking for, for profit targets, I will look to typically uh, front run or take a signal um, to exit or scale when I get to the inverse of, of the uh, kind of entry idea, which is where price has moved quickly uh, down away from it, because there is potential that there's more selling pressure, more unfilled sell orders that didn't get filled up in here, and price is uh, potential to struggle there. And nice. you can see kind of just how, what happened here afterward. Final one, here we go. All right, so this is another one, I believe. Just check here. Yeah, so this one is purely based on like unusual, I'm gonna call it unusual order activity. We see like highly aggressive, uh, high volume action here. Um, and uh, let's go into a detail. So what we're doing is I'm just gonna be zooming up uh, on this, this particular area where we mm -hmm. had like a tape bomb come down, um, pushing orders violently through this area. And then we see uh, passive sellers come up and aggressive buyers immediately start to come up and absorb into this area. This alone, you know, is, if you were to look at this in a vacuum, I think um, seeing these orders fill here, but price continue to the downside like that is kind of a bearish signal to me especially mm -hmm. if someone is establishing a position here um, and or they're expecting to to get a bounce here and they want to establish or play the bounce and then they are put in the red and they're in pain but these further tape bombs you know, these aggressive moves to the downside they just they weren't getting met with um, with continuation. So I'm going to back up an image. So we were just looking at this region. After we saw price not get con continue continuation from this level and then push back above where these buyers were aggressively uh, purchasing, seeing price support above where some of these bigger players were in pain or are in pain, um, that was valid confirmation for me to continue to scale and kind of add with the thesis that we were going to maintain above this and potentially squeeze these guys as long as we're holding within this 4605 area. And then here's uh, re the resulting image is we do see that this price holds and we get a squeeze to the upside um, for, an, for a nice reversal there. Um, so that's, those are the five uh, things I wanted to share. Um, hopefully it was illuminating about how I look at it, but really it's, it all comes back to the most critical component, I think, of this is setting the, setting the context, but that's just not enough to be able to, to form a, a thesis to execute on. It really comes down to book map and how bookmap is providing the order flow, being able to read the order flow and look at what transactions are occurring in the moment and make uh, an, an execution and entry based on bookmap and then managing the trade using that intraday order flow from bookmap as well. So there you go. Very well said. Um... I love the way you speak <laughs> and some great charts in there, very clean and uh, great trading, I must say. Um, I mean, obviously, everybody has their own unique style, um, but your style to me seems very clean, if, if I may say so. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very impressed, especially since you, you know, you haven't been trading that long, really. Uh, so it's uh, quite impressive. Thank you um, very much. 
and yeah, well well deserved <laughs> for winning Blue Jacket. Um, any final words? Any final comments? Or or would you like to just wrap up? Uh, thank you again for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure uh, doing this interview and getting to share uh, some of my setups and just my um, background and how I view the market. Uh, so I appreciate the the time and then also uh, again I appreciate the the product and also how you guys are serving the community around Bookmap. Uh, so here's to many more years. Uh, of book map and uh, good trades to come. Okay, thank you, Dylan, aka Prof. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.